Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to this opening session of this three-day symposium on global extractivism and alternatives. And uh, welcome on behalf of the of the organizers here at the University of Helsinki. We will be having a, in this first session a roundtable discussion with three prominent authors on extractivism. First, we will have as a speaker Eduardo Cudinas. He, he has published many books on uh, extractivism, especially in Latin America, mostly in Spanish, but also many publications in, in English. And he will be first speaking for 15-20 minutes. Uh, after that, we will have uh, Dr. Alexander Dunlap from the University of Oslo, who is the author of uh, several books on this topic and other publications, for example, The Violent Technologies of Extraction, and so on. And after that, Anna Below, a professor of anthropology from the Ohio State University, will give her comments. And after that, we will have a free-flowing debate and discussion around the topic of uh, how to define extractivism, how should we use that concept, what are the potentialities of that concept, what are the limits, how it should be used and should not be used, and try to get some clarification on this rising and important topic and concept. And after that, we will have several other sessions on other topics related to extractivism and transformative alternatives in these coming three days. And my name is Markus Kröger from the University of Helsinki, and I will be here helping to facilitate this session uh, together, with, together with my colleagues. And uh, without further pre-talk, uh, welcome all. And please, Eduardo Gurinas, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for the invitation. Well, as Marcus had explained, we have to address a lot of issues, a lot of questions about the idea of extractivism. To help with these uh, initial remarks, I do have a small set of slides and also to help, uh, help it with my, my English. I will refer to our use of the concept of extractivism uh, more than 15 years ago, and I will explain how we develop the concept, why we develop the idea, but also keeping in mind Marcus and Barry's uh, questions about the utility of the concept and also looking to the future of the concept. More than 15 years ago, the idea, the term extractivism was already there at least in our work, in, mainly in South America, and we was used, was referred to local conflicts, was used by governments, by the international financial institutions like the World Bank, and also by scholars. The world, the concept have a history, and the history re remembers struggles and conflicts, for example, in Africa or in Asia with the oil sector at the meaning sector. So the first definitions at that time in South America, please keep in mind that time in South America was the first initial years of the so-called progressive or new left or pink tight governments. We need a definition of extractivism for a new political context, new governments that continue mining or an oil activities, but after a very different, different political discourse. So the need of a definition focus on a very precise description, the need to distinguish extractivism from other activities, and also to communicate with social movements, to engage in debates at the public arena and so on. But also, and this is my first point for this debate today, the initial <clears throat> step for the definition was always related to look for alternatives. We produce definitions thinking in alternatives to extractivism. So if we think and we promote options for change, for change for what, to what? That is a critical point of extractivism as a concept. We would never be, uh, we were never interested in the scholar debate. That was a political debate, mainly focused on the alternatives. 
So the, the definition, the basic basic definition at that time is here summarized in this uh, slide. It's a particular type of appropriation of natural resources or many different types. This is one type. It is related to high volume or high intensity. At least half 50% or more is exported that refer to that historical component of the idea related to the sporting sectors. But also we stress that it's exported as raw materials, as commodities with minimal or very low processing. And also the concept include all phases starting with exploration, then with very old abandoned mines in many different countries. The consequence of this uh, definition, working definition, there are many consequences. Only because of time constraints here, I will only refer to a few of them. One of the first consequences is that extractivists are always plural, with an S at the end. So I like very much the title of this symposium because they include the term in plural. There are not only mineral extractivists, oil extractivists, but also extractivists in the agricultural sector with cattle, with fisheries and forestry. And also many products could be engaged in an extractivist mode of appropriation from sugar cane to bananas and so on. The second consequence of the definition is that extractivists are always local and global at the same time. The link is always global. The global condition impose prices, demand, investment, capital flows, technology inputs, and so on. But the resources are always local. They are rooted in places. Mineral deposits are in specific places. Soybeans require specific soils and so on. So they are always local. Another consequence is that extractivist is not an industry. I hate that word extractive industries. I hate it. If you look today, for example, the World Bank page about the extractive sectors, they continue to use extractive industries, because this is a sector that is not an industry, but also this is important in terms of the alternatives as I explained earlier. Extractivism is based on the common sense in on the imaging, on the metaphor that they are similar to factories, to industries, and people tend to think that there are large lines of workers each morning waiting to enter a very big factory in the oil camp or mining sector or in the farm. And this is not true. So one of the main tasks of the post extractivist altern alternatives is to deconstruct, to abandon this discourse. And we start with more precision with the words. Extractivism is not an industry. So in these examples, I'm trying to explain the another, another component of the definition. The definition have implication, have consequence on how to use the word and how to imagine and propose alternatives. Furthermore, there is no production. This is a very strong discussion with mainstream economics. There is nothing like an oil production or copper production or iron production. It is only extraction. And also we don't, don't like very much to open the concept so broad that to refer, for example, to extractivist development because development is many, many more things, issues and sectors that only extractivism. And the same is with terms like extractivist capitalism. Capitalism is more institutions, market regulation, many other issues, process and institutions that only those refer to the extractive sector. 
under this discussion, this initial discussion, <coughs> what happens is here summarized very, very briefly with a lot of mistakes, but at least I hope useful for this discussion. There was a very strong response from the government academy and the corporations that promote other definitions of extractivism for many different reasons. That is not a question here. But most of this definition emphasize, stress that everything is an extractivism. Extractivism is any kind of human nature relationship where you took resources from nature. So there is no basic or essential distinction between a farmer dealing with potatoes for the local community and the very big agribusiness that export soybean to China. There is no main difference between a small miner with gold in a remote location in the Amazonian basin with the very big oil open pit gold mining corporations, for example, in Peru. It's only a difference of intensity, a difference of scale, a difference of size. And many civil society groups were trapped in the same idea. They were trapped. They considered that was only a matter of um, intensity. To overcome this uh, debate, we take the concept of mode or modes of production after a Marxian perspective, not a Marxist perspective, but a Marxian perspective. And we split that concept in two different ones. One is modes of production that may refer to industry, trade or consumption, <clears throat> more or less in the classical sense, and even considered that could be divided in many different subsets. And the new one of modes of appropriation. There are a diversity of modes of appropriation that refers to that very first initial stage, the first stage where we take resources from nature. The use of the Martian idea of modes requires to address social, technological, capital, labor, and so on, many different social relationships and social institution, how we take those resources. So we reach this table. <clears throat> this table, there are many different appropriation modes. And keeping in mind the examples that I have just shared with you, for example, if you have those in the corner, in the left and up of low intensity and volume, and the resources taken from nature are used at the local markets, or families or communities. This is the example, for example, of the farmer. On the other hand, extractivism is there, the red box. It's only one type of appropriation modes of high volume or intensity that are mainly devoted to the external global markets. And this was very useful to introduce a debate that the farmer of the small miner is very different from extractivism. And extractivism, we stress once again, is linked to the global conditions, the global markets. This definition requires more precision about property and also access. And that is very clear in Latin America because many resources are in the hands of the state or the nation, but the access is under the control of companies we introduce as a consequence of the definition <clears throat> local impacts. The study of local impacts <clears throat> are the more prominent. Uh, there are a number of reports, papers, journals, books, and so on about the local impact. But we need to introduce <clears throat> the idea of non-local effects that we call spillover effects that refer to changes in policies and politics that permits another consequence of extractivism. And one of the use of these definitions is that those spillover effects at the policy and politics level are even more import important that social and ecological negative impacts at the local level. 
they are more important because they are more <clears throat> relevant, more difficult to overcome, more difficult to deal with the alternatives, and all are easily recognized by people and political actors. <clears throat> At the same time, there are other definitions of extractivism. I divide this in two sets for this uh, very brief presentation. The first set is what I will call today the ugly perspective. Everything that is ugly, bad or negative is called extractivism. So those activities that have <clears throat> ecological impacts, negative impacts in local communities, conflicts, violence, many people tend to refer to label them, to use the term extractivists. And better if the, a big corporation, and even better if a northern big corporation is involved in the That ends in a lot of confusions, in a very diffuse term that is not always very useful to deal <clears throat> with. And more and more definition, more recent ones. Here I have produced a list for you of the last ones that I have in mind. Extractivism is presented at any use of natural resources. There are reference to financial extractivism, urban extractivism, epistemological extractivism, musical extractivism, ontological extractivism, and so on. <clears throat> the term extractivism became so cool, so sexy, that it's used in so many different sets, perspectives, and approach. <clears throat> For example, this debate about the financial extractivism is very difficult to support because in some way they forget many and very good analysis of financial and capital analysis, but many different economic, political perspective, and force a use of a <clears throat> destructivist concept that because of its history is rooted in human ecology, political ecology, social ecology perspective into a political economy debate. So after this balance of so many different uh, definitions and the example I present you with our uh, definition, I think another problem I would like to stress for this discussion is what is a definition? What is the purpose of a definition? In my view, there is some sort of crisis in the social science to deal with definitions. This is on one side related to even more and more complex problems. On the other side to the difficulties and opportunities to engage in political debates at the public at the large or with social movements. But also I feel because I am part outside of that, of this scholar pressure to publish and produce papers, books and journals and so on. Because everybody in the academic field will like to have their his own or her own definition of destructivism, and they are pushing for more and more definition, introducing more and more <clears throat> components and concept. A fourth point is, that in, at least in our experience, the definition of extractivism will require at least precision, coherence, correspondence between the objectives or the grounds of the definition and its consequence, and stability. Just a few comments of, about these four points of a definition. Yesterday I was reviewing a paper by a colleague from Chile where he, in the paper he presents a new definition on destructivism and destructivism in his vision is only referred to the activities of foreign companies. So the definition is not stable, have no stability because in Chile, one of the largest mining companies is Codelco, that is a state company. And also that definition will not apply to the other countries like they have, because they have their own state companies. For example, last Sunday in the Bolivian election, 
the socialist movement again won the election. Uh, we will have a new government by the socialist movement. The socialist movement, movement have their own mining gold company that is called Evo with a large B. Is the Empresa Boliviana del Oro. So that definition, the initial definition that only refers to foreign company is not stable. If you have to change the definition each time you face a new case, the definition is not stable and so on. So as uh, closing my comments after this very, very, very uh, brief uh, points, I still think that the main issue of the definition of destructivism should be linked or related to promote post-extractivist alternatives. So the definition should be robust, strong enough to be presented at the public at large, should be clear to distinguish extractivist, these activities related to the global condition because that is the main difference with any other activity at the local and national levels and should be engaged with civil society groups, should be clear, should be short, simple to be understand. And this is also a task for the scholars on how to handle definitions and how to deal with that in these political debates. Thank you very much for your time in these initial uh, comments. Many thanks, Eduardo, for the fantastic presentation on your definition of extractivism. It was very clear. So next, we will follow with Alexander Dunlap. Please. All right. Thanks so much for having me, Barry, Marcus, and everyone else for kind of showing up and listening. I'm happy to be here. So I guess I'm probably one of the people who's, I mean, first of all, I kind of always avoided the term extractivism specifically. I, I prefer to natural resource extraction or find a way because I know there's a lot of intense debates around the term and I wasn't always sure between some of the decolonial camps and the different kind of Marxist camps and how they'd fight about it. So I tended to kind of be careful or try to avoid the term, but I'm definitely guilty of someone who wants to, I pretty much look at everything as kind of natural resource extraction. And, I, and really the way I kind of relate to the terms or how I use them is try to relate to kind of, kind of what I see and how I experience the world through the different kind of areas and cases that I work in. And so I've worked on wind energy development in Mexico. I worked on coal mining with my friend Andrea Brock in, in Germany. I'm here in France right now looking at uh, energy infrastructure and the different kind of harms it causes and also copper mining in Peru. And it's kind of from this that, and kind of seeing the process of not only kind of how I grew up or what I see happening to the world, but it's also, you know, how do we describe what's happening? You know, what's, and extractivism might be a very, is a very important word to describe what's happening. But I, I mean, I guess maybe the root of some of this is always gonna be kind of your politics or how you relate to the world or how you position yourself. I think at the root of every kind of conversation is, is, you know, what do you, how do you, what do you need, you know? What, what are the foundations and pillars that you're gonna to wanna to have in, in modern society? And I guess the way I kind of approach this research is that while I use computers and while I have a cell phone for my work and I travel more than I even really want to sometimes, even if it's fun and adventurous, is I know that really the priorities of what I need are kind of healthy relationships, clean food, uh, nice water, friends, and, and abilities to make choices or kind of mobility. So I don't necessarily have a, I would, I would say that my Stockholm syndrome or my, my loyalties to industrial infrastructure are very low. And it's kind of from this perspective that I, I've kind of gone towards, I, I think Michael Tossing's kind of devil and commodity fetishism to relating the way that people talk about extractivism and how early on referred to them as devils and kind of taking on these mythical qualities. And so I, I've been attracted recently really to the kind of the mythical and the kind of the poetic ways of being able to understand and make sense of infrastructure and, the, and the, really the banal and everyday processes of just, of the way that kind of brutalist architecture and kind of planning and big projects are put in place and, and what they're really doing to the world. And it's kind of from this, I, I've been drawing on Freddie Perlman, who is someone who, while translating lots of important texts of the situationists and people has 
very much rejected academia. And he wrote a fun book called Against His, His Story, Against Leviathan. That was this very, it, it reads a bit like a master's paper in terms of a, there's no structure. It just goes from the beginning of civilization and it's kind of way to the end. But in this, there's an extreme poetic quality in understanding how civilization has developed and conflicts have taken place. And despite historical inaccuracies, is, is very good at talking about what's kind of been happening to the world. And it's from this he mentions the term only three or four times in the text, but the world eater. And so for me, I, I found it very, I think it's very interesting to actually conceive of industrial infrastructure, electrical grids, and thinking of these things of looking at what's happening to humans and how they're actually living and kind of acquiescing to different kind of technological systems and, and live ultimately surrounded by concrete, steel, asphalt, wires, pipes, and how humans have become entangled with environments that are made from highly processed processes of natural resource extraction, degradation, manufacturing, crazy kind of labor conditions of production. And we, I mean, right now I'm sitting in a weird kind of concrete, <laughs> concrete cell in some French apartment building. And so it, it's, it's really looking at these things of like, you know, what are we doing in this world? And how does this work? And there's a lot of ways I can reflect negatively on even what academics do and, and how that is. And so extractivism is fun. I'm, I mean, in terms of definitions, I, I'm very open. I, I really liked the Ramon Grafogel, his kind of piece he broke down a couple years ago, talking about kind of economic extractivism that Eduardo is famous for kind of mentioning, but also looking into kind of uh, Leanna Simpson's kind of cognitive extraction, but which is related to epistemological extraction and ontological extraction to really try to go deep in terms of how we're relating and how we kind of, we live in this world and what we do and what, what we live with, you know? And sometimes I like to think that, uh, you know, we, we take the metaphor of Superman and how kryptonite was his, you know, his ultimate weakness. I sometimes wonder if in human vitality, you know, it's things like asphalt, concrete, steel, electronics. I mean, we, we all sit in front of computers too long. The way that we feel a certain vitality or life kind of maybe be drained from us a little bit. But I mean, just to, I don't want to talk too long, but just to kind of center this. So one of the issues that I deal with is, is the idea of renewable energy. A lot of what I work on and maybe I, I kind of am talking about is this idea of green extractivism. But so one of the things that I face, and I've, I've worked with Zapotec and Akut people in Mexico who've been fighting these things and picking up their shotguns and slingshots against these. I'm with French kind of land defenders and of various different types here who are fighting energy infrastructure. And there's, there's serious consequences <laughs> for not only mining, building, and manufacturing kind of so-called renewable energy infrastructure, whether they're wind, solar, hydroelectric, and the power lines and transformers that connect them, but the question for me arises is what if there is, for me, none of these things are renewable in any, in any ecological and maybe to some degree social sense, none of these infrastructures are sustainable or renewable or ecologically sustainable. And so the question for me that I would want to approach this idea of extractivism, which I think is related is, is there such thing as renewable energy? And if so, what is it? And kind of the preliminary idea, which I think relates to this, because I'm definitely I'm definitely on the, for the box diagrams of Eduardo, I'm, I'm definitely more closer to kind of the middle in terms of making sure that the impacts are minimized as much as possible and are, are more local, if not national. But, you know, what, how would we conceive of renewable energy? And for me, this is about, I think one of the things that's important is how humans have been kind of separated from our environments. There's been a scale in terms of how cities and people are designed and how things are constructed, how things are planned, it seems a bit out of control in terms of bureaucracy. But I think one of the main principles of what would make energy renewable is to make sure that it goes back into the different life cycles that they're taken from. Meaning that you are, if you're mining or doing things like this, that you're making sure that you're putting this energy back into the, back into the earth, back into the ecosystem, looking out for different kinds of animal populations. And this is kind of the, the more sensitive issue with ideas of wind energy development is that uh, the big line with the World Bank or you, any big body, any big government right now, I mean, the whole world's being covered with solar and wind power in addition to other kind of nuclear and hydrocarbon projects is that there's infinite sun, there's infinite wind and things like this. But the reality is these are vital flows that go across, go across the earth, go across the world, and that you're actually dissipating and you're taking out the velocity and you're... I, they, the technical term is creating a velocity deficit in wind currents. 
that have been empirically proved to be actually raising and changing weather and weather, alt weather and climate behind different large scale wind parks and things like this. There are some benefits in terms of how animals and different birds are adapting, but it's overall there is an extraction in terms of how vital flows are taking place and going through things, which can affect who, I mean, the, the rippling effects of these things are unknown, like any kind of technological development. But I will kind of leave it there. There's plenty to talk about. And, but in general, I, I tend to be very, very loose and try to look at the ways of how extractivism can be used as a term. And I think the, the points brought up by Eduardo in terms of you know, what's actually gonna be coherent, uh, precise, and kind of stable in some ways and looking how this works. But for me, it's, it's really this idea of how much coercion how much is being taken from something and what type of kind of negative relationship it creates in the moment or after. Wonderful. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, next we will have um, Anna Vilo jumping in. So Anna is also an author of several important new books on the topic, uh, like, like Eduardo and Alexander. And um, it would be lovely to hear also from you how you have in thinking through this concept of extractivism, how it has uh, impacted your thinking, for example, around activism and, um, and so on. Yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed listening to Eduardo and to Alexander um, talk about their perspective. My way of thinking about extractivism has more in common with Eduardo's and it has differences. I also define um, extractivism pretty broadly. Uh, and so I think I have a lot of commonalities with what Alexander was saying, especially in terms of thinking about the negative impacts and the relationships that are implicated in extractivism. So I define extractivism, um, I, I did clearly in my 2018 book, as a mindset and a pattern of resource procurement that is based on removing as much material as possible for as much profit as possible. So key here is the idea that extractivism is more than just a way of using the earth and its resources. Extractivism is also a way of thinking. It's a way of being in the world. It's a way of positioning oneself in relationship to the natural world one occupies. So as I see it, this is the distinction between extraction, which is something humans have been doing since before they were human, and extractivism. Um, so it's not as Eduardo mentioned, it's not just a matter of intensity in my view, it's a, a matter of how we're thinking about it. It's a mindset. So because of this, uh, extractivism is not just and not even primarily an environmental problem. It's profoundly political, social, cultural, and economic. Um, so it's probably clear by now and from my introduction that I approach the idea of extractivism from an anthropological perspective. I put culture center in my thinking. So I tend to see extractivism as an attribute of culture. And like Eduardo emphasized, this opens doors for thinking about alternatives and thinking about change, right? So like other cultural att attributes, extractivism is particular to a given time and place. I like to think that extractivism is a pe peculiarity of our contemporary Western industrial civilization. So if extractivism isn't universal, it hasn't always been with us, that means that our way of thinking, our way of relating to the environment can be changed. So that implies that we have other options for crafting a healthier and a more sustainable relationship with the non-human world, as well as with other humans. So I really came to the extractivism concept as a citizen of the planet as much as a scholar, someone who's very deeply concerned about the future. So I've used the concept from the outset to identify what I see as the underlying core problems, right? You know, I wanted, I wanted to get at the core. What really is the problem here, right? And as I see it, that's our way of thinking, right? Extractivism is a way of thinking. So definitely my view of extractivism developed from the beginning as an instrument of cultural critique. As I indicated, I find extractivism particularly useful as a holistic critique of Western industrial civilizations, human environmental relationships, its economic structures, its social injustices, and its deeply problematic system of values that prioritizes short-term thinking, self-centeredness, consumerism. 
So as I see it, this kind of critique can help us in a lot of ways. Um, one thing it does is it helps us go beyond targeting single issues one at a time, right? Saying this mine is bad, that you know, example of logging is problematic. And it can help us get to the deep roots of all of these problems, the roots that are, are deeply intertwined. Um, if we can't do that, if we can't get to the root of the problem, we are destined to move endlessly from problem to problem with new fires to put out, rearing up as soon as we think we finally solve something. So I think the extractivism idea is especially useful for making connections between the countless distinct disasters that we see unfolding all around us. It helps us realize that all of these things are part of the same larger problem. And for me, that's useful because it helps me know where to direct my efforts, right? I feel like it helps helps keep us from falling for false solutions that are short in term and small in scale. So personally, I would rather address the big problem than all of the little ones. You know, so, you know, sure, I want to overhaul consumerist culture. I want to create a more sustainable new civilization. But I can't do that overnight. I can't do that by myself. All I can do is take tiny baby steps. For me, it gives me a certain peace of mind to be able to identify the larger struggles that the small local things I do contribute to, right? So that's um, one of the key values that I see in the extractivism concept. Um, got a lot more to talk about, but I think there, uh, with that, we can open it up to some more fluid conversation. Great, thank you, Anna. So now that everybody of our invited speakers have explained a little bit about how they understand extractivism and how they have used that as a concept, maybe we could now have a more free-flowing discussion around the questions I sent earlier to all the speakers about defining extractivism. If Eduardo or Alexander, if you would have something to add, Eduardo, please go ahead. Thank you very much for uh, these um, presentations. Well, I, I have read, for example, Alexander, I have read all your book, the Whoa. whole book about the war eater. Yeah. And in the case of Anna, I didn't read the, the book because I didn't have it, but read your papers. So if you can then, after this, send me the, the book, I would be delighted. But I do have some reactions. And I hope to explain better some of the ideas I introduced uh, before. For example, just, just an example. When Anna refers in her definition of destructive as much material as possible, as much profit as possible, if I use an anthropological comparative perspective, these two components are found, for example, in many farmer economies and peasant economies all around the world. And they are not extractivists, at least in our concept. Why? Because even small farmers, family farmers, peasant farmers, will like to extract as much as possible in their crops. And of course, they would like to have as much profit as possible because they are engaged, they are in a <clears throat> market capitalist system. So these are the, 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 those details that are referred to coherence or precision in the definition. And I understand the spirit of the, your definition. I endorse, I like it very much. But when I put the magnifying glass, the microscope on the definition, appear these sorts of elements. And it's similar in the definition of Alexander. The, the idea of Alexander of the war eater is that Almost everything ends to be part of destructivism. Of course, there is a cultural component uh, behind extractivism, but this is part of the study of destructivism. I would like to explain this in my limited English, but you have on one side the definition of a thing, and you require more precision to distinguish distinguish that thing from other things and communicate that difference. And on the other side, the study, the description, the overview, the analysis of the qualities of the concepts of that thing. 
In our study of the structure teams, we use, for example, to explain many of the interesting issues addressed by Alexander and Anna, the idea of the common sense, extractivist common sense. In that idea, we follow <clears throat> the perspective the reading of um, the Caribbean British anthropologist Stuart Hall when he referred to the common sense. And there is a very strong common sense in our society that supports extractivism. And this is one of the main barriers to overcome when dealing with alternatives, because everybody thinks, well, not everybody, most people think that it's very good to have mining <clears throat> exports, oil, and so on. And we select the perspective of Stuart Hall also because of this political perspective, because Stuart Hall introduced the idea of the common sense at the time of the Margaret Thatcher neoliberal revolution, when he addressed the role of the British traditional left that was unable to see the strong and deep changes in society and in market relationship and in all of the state. And also because Stuart Hall um, highlighted that there are, let's say, uh, irrational components in this approach. Moving a bit more on this concept, we introduce or we introduce no, we use the idea of uh, political theology to explain the um, support, the strength of the extractivist approach. Extractivists are more related, are more similar to a, some sort of political religion. That is the useful component that brings with us the political <clears throat> theology analysis. One of the consequences of this is that despite all the reports, all the studies that make very clear, thousands and thousands of reports and books that make very clear, for example, the negative environmental impacts of mining, the impact of um, oil in climate change, or all around, uh, all the discussions around agrochemicals, Toxic, toxic effects. Nevertheless, most people, most scholars, most politicians still endorse extractivism. And this is also related to this political, theological perspective. And this um, explains our relationship with the ontological term. And now I refer to Alexander. We also a lot. Uh, very much and very heavily logical term because they are essential for the alternatives. In very briefly, alternatives requires an ontological term move beyond some modernity, shared values like use value, exchange value, materiality, the duality between nature and society. But my point is that the use of the concept and the category of ontological term in that context is very good, is very tight, is, it has coherence, but it is loose when it uses ontological term to the description of extractivism. These are categories, ideas for different things, different problems, different situations. Well, I have more things, but Perhaps later I will add some other comments. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for reading my work. I, I appreciate it. Sometimes I feel like a lot of everything I do just gets lost in the academic database and it doesn't really matter. So thank you. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of related to the theological perspective, I, I really think a lot of this comes down to first Genesis verse 28, where it's go forth and multiply, dominate the fowl and the pharaoh of the land and humans and so forth that kind of establishes kind of human supremacy over the land and to kind of, yeah, go on and go forth and multiply and, and make what you want to make. So I, I couldn't agree there. And I, I'm, I'm most certainly guilty of taking a, uh, <laughs> the kind of everything is extractivism approach. But at the same time, I just want to stress, and especially the book, The Violent Technologies of Extraction, it, it definitely is kind of getting out there the best I can with kind of going deep with like critical social theory and looking at kind of a larger macro perspective. But I, I just want to stress, like I, I spent a lot of time going door to door, <laughs> talking to people in their pueblos or 
in rural France and things like this. And so I just want to, despite this kind of this perspective, I, I can empathize very much with people and the choices and why they do things. And it makes perfect sense in terms of trying to survive or to kind of have a comfortable life and comfortable living. And yeah, I, I can empathize with really nasty stuff. You know, I, I, I talk to really kind of people who do lots of kind of bad stuff. But uh, I think my, my fixation for me is that, I mean, it's all pretty obvious in terms of what humans are doing or really what specific types of humans are doing to the world that it's, that it's causing serious ecological, social, economic, and seri like serious problems to the world. And it's, for me, the signs are very clear if you just look outside in terms of the type of infrastructures and habitats and, and dwellings that are being created, which are, are based on kind of an economic calculus. It's run so there can be more profit the next quarter, depending on what type of energy infrastructure, what you're doing. So I guess a lot of my perspective is just, is like, yeah, this is, of course, the common sense is, is rooted in extremely high levels of violence. There's a, a very normalized level of, of destruction taking place. And I, I think Anna, from what I read in some articles, was very good talking about the cumulative of these kind of different infrastructures, of the, these kind of different projects, and also on top of kind of settler colonial relationships in place. But it's, and that, that's the thing right now. So I deal a lot with energy transition and so-called renewable energy, or what I like to say fossil fuel plus, is that it's just adding on and building more infrastructure. There's no sign of stopping or slowing. And it's, it, to me, it seems, it seems completely out of control in terms of people's kind of relationship with actually what gives us life. And this, this is a question about where people's values are, how they relate to the world and what they care about, which again is a bit what Anna was uh, referencing or beginning to talk about, and I imagine has a lot in her work, but it's, this is about how we relate to the world and how we, what we value, you know, and, and for me, I, I, yeah, I don't necessarily want to live like this. I, I don't want to live on a computer. I don't want to live addicted to expensive books, you know, and it's, and I can change this, but I guess there's a certain addiction that I struggle with in terms of having deep kind of political conversations, getting to speak with lovely people like you that kind of, binds me into the, this kind of this kind of system. And I guess for me, and if we're talking about extractivism, I, and really what resonates is kind of ontological and epistemological extractivism. And I, I can be very self-critical to myself in terms of when I'm doing interviews and trying to get information out of people, but there is such a damage, the, the academic lifestyle is so unhealthy in terms of what it does and what it promotes and what it's tied up in. And so I guess the kind of the, the short answer besides some of the things that I struggle with or I have a hard time with is that I, I, want, to, I want to be very serious and draw, look very critically at what we're kind of, what we're in and how we're kind of constantly taking from our environments and the people around us. And that it's very, it's not practical in terms of kind of the society that we live in, some of the critiques or what's being talked about in terms of any easy kind of rolling out solutions that, uh, that might come with a more coherent definition of extractivism or alternatives to it. But uh, these are some of the things I'm dealing with and I don't want to take up too much time. Yeah, I can chime in just very, very briefly um, in response to that. It's fascinating to talk about um, extractivism in connection to things that are usually um, discussed as renewable energy and things that are positive, like wind energy in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in southern Mexico, or some of the massive um, solar installations in southern Europe that are being put in and local people are adamantly opposed to them. Um, so those things we see again and again, you know, might be positive um, in terms of the, the reduction of carbon into the atmosphere, right? Good thing, sure. But they absolutely reproduce the same extractivist mentality that I was critiquing earlier, right? So I'm on board with you there, Alexander, and thinking about that and, and seeing it as very problematic and, and seeing the need to go beyond and find a whole new solution. Um, and this is also very much what I'm getting at in terms of, um, you know, the idea of extractivism as a belief system, right? I mean, it's an ism, right? It, it's a mentality, it's an ontology, it's a, a political way of thinking about the world. Um, so again, I think all of that comes back to what I was talking about when I said that extractivism is really a cultural system, it's a cultural problem, and, you know, that's 
to me, where we need to start, right? Rather than going for technological solutions, we need to start, you know, inside with each and every one of us and our relationships and start that healing and that transition there. Wonderful, great. Thank you everybody for the more depth, more in-depth um, discussion and debate around the definition of extractivism. So I think at this stage, it's quite clear that we have here different definitions of extractivism and that's very healthy to have now a better understanding that what for example we can refer to or how we should reference for example how a different author uses extractivism for our own purposes then and there are different purposes to which that concept can be used and I think there needs to be more precision based on this discussion and how one refers one's use of extractivism. So maybe to further elaborate on the, on what is extractivism and what is not in your definitions, Eduardo, Anna and Alexander. So could you give a, some con a concrete example of what is extractivism and what is not? For example, is, is um, the clear cutting of Amazon rainforest for beef production there for domestic use in the local neighborhood? Is that extractivism? You can also give other examples, please. If, you could answer to that. Start that, that is not an example. I, I think that um, thinking about the question, there are two end points. One end point is that extractivism is almost everything that is part of modern of modernity. That is one of my main concerns. And some of the expanded definitions of extractivism tend to overlap with modernity. And I think that this is not uh, the case. Because if extractivism is everything, it's very difficult to fight for alternatives. For example, for a mining project, if extractivism is everything. I think in modernity, there are many problems that are not described, of course, by the concept of extractivism, even in that expanded sense. Let me give me uh, an example. Love bit among the couple. Love relationships, hate relationships, and so on, could not be described with the tools, terminology, and so on of the extractivists, even in the most expanded versions of uh, love. Loneliness, to be alone. One of the main problems now with the pandemic is far beyond the toolbox box the talks of the extractivist uh, approach. On the other end point, extractivists could be so, so, so little that only refers, for example, to the largest oil or mining company. That was more or less the case in the uh, last century when extractivists was mainly a discussion of the oil companies in Nigeria, the Middle East, and of the mining, very old, big open pit mining projects in South America. Also, I would like to, to follow your question, Marcus, and also take some of the questions in the chat room, because they are related, <clears throat> about the, the solutions about the pandemic. Why? Because in some of the alternatives that we've been briefly discussing uh, this uh, today, my morning, your afternoon, when you refer, for example, for, to Keynes, look into that discussion from the South. In the last month, had been a very strong influence, a very strong overflow of debates about the Green New Deals in many different versions. But when we examine the concrete specific positions of the Green New Deals, for example, inside the Democratic Party in the United States, either the proposal by Ocasio-Cortez or the proposal by Bernie Sanders, or when we recall the initial debate in the United Kingdom, when the Labour Party with Corbyn addressed the issue of uh, global and green new deal 
their approach, for example, to environmental issues and climate change could end in even more extractive in the South to supply the raw material for energy conversion. And one of the basic points that we are discussing in the South is that to overcome the growth paradigm, the growth emphasis is not properly endorsed because most of those perspectives are in fact new versions of the Keynesian, Keynes approach of a very big state with a lot of money to provide more employment and so on. And also an approach developed in times of very cheap oil. On the other hand, climate change here in the South is more related to emissions from deforestation and land, age, land use change. That means, that means our main issues here in the South are referred to agriculture strategies, land reform, agrarian reform, all issues that are forgotten are not included in the global and green new deals. So when I refer to this, the, the, the matter of precision of extractive means, this is one of the examples of the discussion of the global green new deals in the North, because they poor, the, 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 they poorly handle the idea of the extractive means could end in even more problems for here, for us here in the, in the South. I will also take <coughs> this because I am looking to Barry there in the screen. I, I, they, they have just published in the journal Globalization an extraordinary paper on the false solution at the, this um, bizarre debate about the different versions to reform capitalism. I recommend you that paper by Splash. Yeah, can I speak to something? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I like where you're going. I, I want to be clear, I don't have a definition of extractivism. Uh, if, if I have any type of definition of extractivism, it's probably related to green extractivism, but I, I don't, I kind of just pick and pull what I want. I'm more focused on identifying kind of the depths of some of the issues going on. And I just want to say, I am not in the definition debate for extractivism, but uh, but no, I, I like very much that you take it to relationships. And I, I think that's also something Anna mentioned because I, I think at the core of it is, is really the relationship that you have with things. And I think it very much can, while, while when we use terms like love and, and hatred, it, it gets difficult in terms of, I don't think there can be extractivism when there's love. I, I agree completely. But I think there's a lot of other different types of relationships in terms of how people are engaging with each other that becomes very hard of whether and how you would actually identify these things. It's, it's kind of the same issue of land grabbing in terms of how do you, whether it's in relationships, land grabbing or extractivism, it's how do you identify consent? Who are the consenting people, you know, and these kind of, and so for a free prior informed consent, the, the ILO 169, according to them, <laughs> Consultation is, uh, consent is just actually consultation. And if you get some kind of portion of the population to agree to it, then it works, you know? So how one decides land grabbing or extractivism really depends on, you know, how you identify coercion, how you identify deception that's kind of taking place. And also I, it, it's, and for me, it's very interesting if we think about the industrial process, because for me, modernity and industrialization, if we're going to be crude and simple about it, it was based on coercion. Also the carrot in terms of creating enchantment and desire for these things, which the post-development school is very good at talking about. And also the blinders, if we're going to take the donkey metaphor, which definitely has its shortcoming. But you know, you put the blinders on the donkey to just see the carrot and then you whip it to keep it moving and staying productive. But it's, um, I, yeah, I think it really comes down to, you know, how do you identify these things? And this gets more complicated when you get into ideas of addiction and dependency, when people are addicted to certain types of junk foods or alcohol or substances or pharmaceuticals. And it becomes this very difficult entanglement in terms of even being even be able to question kind of industrial development or cybernetic or technological progress in these ways. And, uh, but yeah, I just want to stress it is about the relationship. And but I would problematize like, you know, how does one identify coercion? How does one identify deception? And a lot of this has to do with kind of cultural normatives 
and and yeah, finally for my party, I, I can't stress and I am I am body deep in European Green Deal right now, and it is nasty. It is a Trojan horse for further like energy market privatization. It is resulting in not only more colonization and extraction in other countries in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America, but it's also turning into a strategy of kind of internal coloniz uh, inter more intense internal colonization for also mining and energy infrastructure, not only to get more lithium and rare earth and different kind of coppers and metals, but also for spreading power lines, transformers, wind projects. I mean, it, it's pretty intense actually what's going on in Europe in terms of they're trying to put a wind turbine or solar panel anywhere and everywhere, which is going to be based on mining within Europe, but likely mostly outside. Thanks. Um, and Anna, would you have some concrete example of what you consider to be extractivism or extractivist project and what not? And after that, maybe if Barry could jump in and contribute something, and then if Sana could introduce some of the discussion in the chat that we haven't touched yet upon to make some guesses for all. Thanks. Sure. Um, so in my, um, you know, in my book and in some of my articles, I give, you know, dozens of concrete examples. Um, and actually this, um, this book, Understanding Extractivism, um, you know, honestly, I wrote that not to contribute to any kind of definitional debate or really even as an academic argument. I wrote that because I wanted to introduce lay readers and undergraduates and people who needed this form of ecological literacy to the concept. Um, and, you know, not even necessarily to the concept in a way that traced its history. I just wanted to get across what I saw as a really important idea, right, um, which I got across earlier, I think, when I talked about how I see extractivism, right, this root of our cultural problem. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of the different examples. <laughs> um, if you want the examples, go and track down the examples or email me. Um, but again, right, extractivism is something that I define broadly, right? It's something that crosses boundaries, it transcends times. It, it's not simply, you know, a way of doing things. It's a, a mindset. Um, so I see that as really critical. And actually, um, in thinking about the questions that were circulated in advance of this session, um, the question about how broadly should we use it, what counts and what doesn't, um, got me thinking about a lot of um, things that, you know, absolutely mirror what Eduardo and Alexander had to say about relationships, right, which I find really fascinating that that came up for all of us, right, personal relationships. Um, so, you know, I, I personally, again, thinking about extractivism, as this large mindset, not wanting to get into a definitional debate, but rather using definitions in ways that seem to work provisionally for the discussion that I'm having or the introduction I'm making. You know, I do think it makes sense. And, and certainly we can use the concept if we're thinking about soil exploitation and, you know, unsustainable industrial agriculture. I think we can use the concept when we're talking about things like labor and the exploitation of workers. Right, we could use it when we're talking about the environment as a sink for polluting byproducts, right? Even though it's kind of reversing the equation, right? We are taking, right, collectively without giving back. Um, I was thinking that it might be very interesting to analyze gender, racial, and class inequities through this lens, although I have not gotten to the point of actually doing that, but I think it's a really interesting proposition. But really, I mean, it's it's so fascinating that I, I do believe it's possible to have relationships, even on a personal level, that reproduce an extractivist dynamic, where one party extracts as much time, energy, and attention from the other as possible, right? So these are inherently inequitable relationships that mirror the inherently inequitable relationship between Western industrial civilization and the non-human world that lies beyond ourselves, right? So what we need instead, right, thinking about alternatives, is to embrace more reciprocal relationships, relationships that we enter into where we only take with the expectation of giving back instead of taking as much as we can. So this is relevant at all scales, this idea of converting our relationships from relationships of taking and extracting, right, used in somewhat of a metaphorical sense here. But instead of extracting out of our relationships, right, we want to, you know, work in a reciprocal way where we have a give and take exchange that we expect to go on beyond 
tonight or tomorrow or next month or next year or next generation, right? So that sets us up for these inherently longer term and therefore inherently more sustainable relationships. Um, just one last quick comment um, regarding uh, what Eduardo brought up regarding the you know, COVID recovery and um, Green New Deal. So this isn't necessarily about the Green New Deal, but I've given lots of thought to the idea of um, you know, perhaps the pause that we have been forced to make, right? You know, the idea that we've been sent into our rooms to think about what we've done, right, in relationship to um, COVID-19 um, is actually a chance to start rethinking our cultural relationships to the world and our ways of doing things. Certainly uh, here in the community that I live in, many of us have started saying, well, we don't want to go back to the old normal. The old normal is so deeply flawed. The old normal is what got us into so much of the trouble that we are in. Um, so I've actually started thinking about um, the possibilities for cultural revitalization that might grow out of this really deepening sense of dissatisfaction with our cultural system. Um, so I'll put the link in the chat in just a minute, but um, one, of the, one of the upsides of the pandemic is that I'm able to participate in multiple conferences in different parts of the world at once. So actually right now I'm also participating in a conference out of the University of California in Santa Barbara um, called Systemic Alternatives in the Age of Coronavirus or something very similar to that. Again, I'll put the chat up there. And the, the thinking that I was referencing earlier um, in relation to cultural revitalization and the need for it um, is a recording that I've got uploaded and that you can watch um, a YouTube link to. So I'll put that uh, in the chat in just a second. So thanks. Thanks, and Barry, would you like to say something? Your mic is not on. Right. Um, thanks, everyone. I'll make some observations. I mean, one, we can, I think, see straight off uh, the power of the concept of extractivisms and global extractivisms in, in, in opening up a window to critique the dominant paradigm of economics as a paradigm of understanding how the world is organized, the dominant paradigm of development, the dominant paradigm of globalization, the dominant paradigm of capitalism, and, and in fact, of our civilization. It's a critical concept that opens up a window to the critique of our contemporary civilization. As it was pointed out, historicized, it's historically created this, this present structure of the world and it, and it is subject to radical change. And I believe it's at a moment of almost comprehensive crisis and implosion and that its radical transformation is inevitable one way or the other, depending on how we, humanity, uh, think and act of course, in to make a new history. So uh, I, mean, I thought that um, this, the idea of, uh, um, of depletion, of negative impact, of harm, of violence, of a non-reciprocity with the web of life and with human beings, always in terms of the system of value, taking so much, taking, 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 and not returning, not storing, uh, not making durable, it's permanent harm from the, from the extraction a relationship. I think maybe we might be able to have some common ground there about, about uh, one part of the definition. The other part that I found uh, I think uh, vitally important is the sense of the mode of appropriation. So uh, this is where, you know, as Eduardo said, this makes all the difference in the world, whether, I mean, the ownership, the concepts of property or of common, <laughs> uh, the pro commodity, uh, all of the all of the the you know the elements of our understanding of uh, how we relate to <laughs> so-called natural resources and to other human beings, um, in fact, all creatures and web of life. This is all the emo the mode of appropriation seems to me a very useful, fruitful approach to understand. And Ivan Illich, a very long time ago, talked about this kind of thing as vitally important. I mean, as Gandhi had done before. The, uh, that you know, the, uh, there are demo technology uh, approaches and, and Aristo technology approaches, and they make all the difference in the world. The same technology can be used in either mode of appropriation and social organization, in fact, um, often. Uh, but anyway, much of what Alex is talking about is Aristo technology. This is mega scale for uh, capital accumulation logic, marketization, commodification, 
brutal, brutal, you know, the brutality of the infrastructure overall, the world leader type of problem, uh, which is, which, you know, by many accounts has, has accelerated the, you know, the sort of great acceleration, the material throughput in the world of the past 40 years is going off the charts. And as many people all around the world are saying, the ecological systems, the feedbacks, tipping zones, they're, they're, they're close to the breaking point. This has to stop. Uh, so, I mean, I think I'm hoping that, therefore, the other thing I would totally agree with is that you can't do one without the other. In other words, intrinsic in the whole perspective is that the reason you use extractivism and global extractivism as a framework of analysis is precisely because you want to contribute very concretely into the debate around the definition of and the construction of real post-extractivist alternatives. And then there's the question of the agents and the question of the scale. I mean, great many real alternatives are built at very small scale, very, very, you know, local and community scale. And, uh, you know, as Anna was saying, you add all those together and actually the aggregate is, is, is very large and very significant. Whereas you may wait, if you see the, like the European Union's plan, uh, maybe more harm than good, more acceleration and intensification of the whole problem. In fact, uh, well, that's for a debate, you know, because decarbonization is, is, is necessary and essential for our species and all the other creatures on, on the earth to, to continue to survive. But, you know, these, these questions of the mode of appropriation, the social organization, the mentality, the practices, scale, they're vital. So thanks for all the comments so far. That's, that's a little observation from me. Great, thank you, Barry. Uh, Sana, could you highlight maybe some uh, of the lively debates and discussions, guesses from the chat, if you have, there's something which has- Yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, starting with with some of the stuff that, for example, Alexander and Anna, Anna have been talking about with green extractivism and false solutions. Uh, Ramon and Stefan have, have similar questions with uh, how do you see the global extractivist landscape and uh, in, in light of the so-called transitions and the post-COVID economic recovery? How do we counter hegemonic green growth narratives in such complex times? And then with Stefan's related question to that is that to what extent is the growing shift towards renewables a new form of common sense rejecting certain types of extraction uh, or is it a merely a reproduction of the status quo? And what implications do these have for post-extractivism and alternatives? <laughs> Who wants to take the first shot? Yes, Alex, please go ahead. Go ahead. I can always take something. Um, not all. Uh, so I guess, yeah, I think Barry's summary is, summary is great. I think we should definitely listen to kind of, I don't think really much has really gone past Ivan Illich's thinking, unfortunately. But that's kind of leads to kind of how do you see the kind of current global arrangement and what to do is, for me, not much has really changed. I mean, it's definitely gone for the worst. I have to wear a mask. There's people with assault rifles walking around me like it's the normal. I, I, I live in the dystopia. I never really wanted to live in. But so... For me, nothing's changed. The trajectory, the, the, the trajectory is right on track for the for the way it's been meant to go for some time, it seems like. Which means that the, the struggle still continues and it's that people shouldn't be discouraged by the worsening situations. If anything, there might need to be a resituating of political theory and how one's to live and carry their life in these these times and these days. But um, I didn't really write down the questions fast enough, even though they're probably in one of these chat rooms. But I, I think it, it just means continue. I think really what Barry said about kind of also what Anna, but also what Barry said in terms of really having local kind of immediate interventions to change your relationships, to live in different ways, to create different spaces, to be able to try to live with your friends and not kill each other, especially if you're engaging in more intense political action with all the stresses and, and things that that can kind of come with. So it's I mean, for me, I would consider how, how do you break out of the existing? Not much has changed. It's just, it's just gone worse. <laughs> There's more mass. And, and right now, I don't, think, I don't think renewable energy, I mean, obviously in the 1970s, when, like, when the ideas of energy transition were coined from the US Department of Energy, I mean, if you just look at the sources of where kind of 
renewable energy and energy transition came from. Obviously, there's a grassroots kind of local small scale. And I, I think that uh, there's going to be some level of extraction if you want to have electricity. And there's ways to be able to do this in healthy ways. But I think at the, the bottom of all of this is that degrowth is got to be a priority or a decolonial degrowth has to be a very serious priority if there's going to be any discussion about so-called renewable energy or fossil fuel plus technologies because at this point uh i've been i've been going through documents i just i was with an i was with the big the big dogs for the region for a, a big electricity grid and they're expanding grid expanding infrastructure expanding movements and trading and buying of energy it's going to like i already said it's going to come with more infrastructure extraction that is extremely toxic i mean a lot of it depending on how many rare earth minerals are in it and there's always going to be rare earth minerals in it. Sometimes they're using permanent magnets. Sometimes they're just spliced into the metals to prevent rusting and different things like this for different technologies. But so overall, you know, kind of the new form. So it, it's very much reproducing the status quo. I think there's always possibilities. There's always lines of flight. There's always ways to, to stop this. But it, it really, it's, yeah, not much has changed. And it, it really comes to people. And wherever they are, wherever they stand, whether they've got an administrative position in a university, whether they're a mayor in a town hall, to really begin organizing to create healthier relationships, to stop extractive relationships, and to really try to revitalize the different fish or the different animal populations, the soil, so on, begin engaging with old indigenous agricultural techniques or gardening or drawing on permaculture. There's, there's so many possibilities to do, but uh, unfortunately, I, I see this trajectory worsening, but that just means people have to be more creative and become more determined and hopefully fend off. While I would advocate a certain type of active nihilism in terms of how we approach things, this isn't to be hopeless. It's not to be demoralized, but to, to take pleasure in defining the things you don't like and to take pleasure in loving the things that you love. Um, can I respond at this point? <laughs> yeah, sure. The chair to go next. All right. Um, so these are great questions. Um, and in the chat, one of the things I noticed that very much goes along with the questions that you actually um, posed, Sana, is the idea of, you know, how, how globally, how at a large scale can we, um, you know, attempt to resist um, extractivism. That's a huge issue. Um, certainly where I find the most hope is when I do look to local levels, because at local levels, we do see sometimes successful, sometimes not successful, sometimes only temporarily successful examples of resistance. Um, certainly, as soon as I came to the concept of extractivism, I immediately emphasized the activism part of that. So again, if you've looked at my book, you'll see the kind of, um, kind of corny um, capitalization that I use. So I write it out extractivism, right? To emphasize, you know, it, so it's very intentional. Um, I emphasize that extractivism is almost always met with activism. And I see extractivism and activism in response or in resistance to it as two sides of the same process um, or two sides of the same coin, so to speak. Um, so, you know, on every continent, everywhere we look, we are seeing people who disagree with not only the actual tangible physical examples of extractivism that are taking place, but we also people who are challenging the extractivist mentality, right? Again, my central focus. Um, and people are doing so in a multitude of ways, right? Everywhere we, you know, almost everywhere we look from Canada to New, uh, you know, New Guinea, uh, we are seeing, you know, tons of examples of indigenous peoples as well as other marginalized people, as well as, you know, people who are part of the, you know, belly of the industrial beast who are challenging this through movements like Buen Vivir. I'm sure Eduardo can tell us a ton more about that. Degrowth, permaculture. Um, now topian prefigurations of better worlds. Um, you know, so just to bring this back to me and my own work and my own directions, um, you know, I actually, for a long time in my career as an environmental anthropologist, I have been doing research on, you know, natural resource extraction, how people respond to it, how people cope with it. Um, I looked at anti-clear-cutting activism in um, Canada. I've looked at you know, hydroelectric dams and the problems that they're causing for indigenous people. Fracking um, here in the Midwestern US where I live. All of this is deeply depressing, right? As a human who cares as a 
as a mother of two children who I have to raise in this dystopian world, I could not emotionally and personally sustain that focus much longer. So actually, even before I completed my book on extractivism, I started participating in and working as a, you know, academic researcher um, on the transition movement. Um, I'm working on transition in my own community where I live, as well as trying to understand how at a larger scale, we can actually have these nodes of local transition that can join together and can actually make a difference and can actually give us hope, which I think is the thing that we need the most right now. Um, so, you know, I, I'm given hope by all of the things that we're doing at the small scale, and I hope that those things can somehow join together. Um, I guess just one last point on this. Um, I was at a you know, went to a talk with a very well-known climatologist, right, who had a pretty grim prognosis for what the future would bring. Um, so, you know, he shared that with all of us. A lot of it I already knew. And by the end, it was hard to feel optimistic. Um, so someone in the audience asked him the question, um, uh, you know, basically said, well, do you see hope? Will humans be able to change? And his answer was that, you know, we won't change just of our own accord, but we will change because we will be forced to change. And again, that's one of the things about the transition movement that, that does give me hope because it basically takes these changes as an, an inevitability, right? Things are changing, they will have to change. And hopefully as reflexive beings who are capable of acting in anticipation of socio-ecological change, right, we will be able to make a difference. We will be able to understand that we're part of the world we live in. And even more than that, we actually have the capacity to shape our worlds for the better, right? So that's what we need to do. Does uh, Eduardo wanna take well, a turn? I, I think I addressed some of the questions in my previous intervention, and also I sent some answers to some of the participants. Uh, just correcting my English there because I was uh, typing at the same time I was hearing Marcus about the gold. The uh, current gold use is about 45% for jewelry and the other 45% for coins and bars. So there is no need for more gold. So the, the, the debate here, at least in South America, is a global moratorium on new mining on gold of any size, of any size by any actor. There are no differences uh, on that. Uh, so I do have some comments about the question of the pandemic and the role of extractivism. I don't know if I would say that uh, comments now or later. Please, Marcus. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, at least in my view, the present situation with the pandemic made uh, extractivism and this discussion one of the most urgent and needed ones. Because at least in the countries in the South, the economic crisis, the social crisis and the employment crisis related to COVID is moving governments to promote more extractivism. Extractivism following any definition and the classical definitions. So governments, for example, in some countries are now opening against all indications by the health system. They are now open back again the mining sector. Other countries are trying to promote new extractivist sectors that replace those that are facing trade problems or market pro problems. So what we are seeing is a new push for more extractivists to enter new regions, to invade new indigenous land and to reduce social and environmental regulation and control. Just a few examples of the last months, <clears throat> a new wave of transgenic crops are being approved in South American countries, in many of them. At the same time, the possibility to face an opposition to react to this 
is even more reduced than in the past. Because in, all, in almost all countries, not in all, but in almost all countries, the pandemic situation is being used for more authoritarian control. And at the same time, most of the population that feels fear either because of health issues or because the economic impact of this crisis. So most of the people accept or even request more authoritarian regulations. A good example is about 45 minutes from my home, from my office here at home, crossing the Rio de la Plata River in Argentina, in the largest quarantine in the world with no effect but with a number of regulation and controls over the people. And he, he, um, here makes the point of the relevance of the spillover concept, because this mix of more authoritarian regulation and this um, common sense that people believe that there is a need for more authoritarian regulation to cope with the pandemic. This reinforce strength and support most of the spillover effects of extractivism. I will refer to <coughs> two of them. To accept higher levels of violence in many different countries. And this violence is faced in the rural areas, particularly by local peasant or indigenous communities. So the violence violence is increasing in many countries and there is no public reaction against that and there is no political debate against that because everybody wants to recover export to recover dollars from the export of natural resources so they are willing to accept more violence as <clears throat> and something that could not be resolved in the moment of crisis and also a weakening the reduction of the rights <coughs> of the human rights and nature's rights background in our countries. Also, this situation means that people are, uh, are facing more barriers to have time, energy, and disposition to think in alternatives beyond current traditional development strategies because they are facing every day more urgent needs like how to get a salary or how to get even food. So under this condition, I, I always reach the same conclusion. Extractivism is now even more important than in the past. I have just finished a book that was published about two or three weeks ago about the, the current situation of alternatives to devel development discussion in South America in this context of the pandemic with a series of preliminary thoughts, thoughts and ideas about this. The book is available free online. If you search it in Google, you will find it. And my, the balance is that I am uh, afraid that we are even in the threat of lose some of the big steps of the victories we won in the recent past. And we are returning to a debate that was the debate of the 80s and the 90s of the last century. I also think that this discussion about the Green New Deal in the North have a role on this retreat to the old discussion. In the book, for example, I discuss some of the alternatives of the North that are being reproduced here in the South. And I focus in one of the chapters for example, in the alternative of Shishek, the philosopher. I, I am uh, sometimes surprised if why Shishek is taken seriously in the North. If you look and read his last book on the pandemic, Shishek promotes as alternative to the current situation, a new version of a communist liberal, a liberal communist, provide as an example of institutional arrangements, the role of the World Health Organization. And he has an ambivalent reaction position about the role of China and how the authoritarian China mode of controlling the pandemic 
could be replaced or used in the rest of the world. So at that level, at that level, with those generalities, so diffuse, so vague, it's very difficult to build an alternative and to present an alternative to the society and the society will take seriously that alternative because people is wo uh, waiting, is in need for more precise answer. If we reduce the extractivist sector, which other sectors will provide employment next year? If we reduce export of commodities, which economic activities will provide the money to sustain the state? And that are the specific points that post-extractivists are trying to address. So this is another um, component, another issue that I consider this, that this extractivist discussion, this extractivist debate needs to be rethink, readapted to this pandemic condition that we are facing today. Thank you, Eduardo. So yeah, I recommend the book in Spanish this uh, by Eduardo. So we need more research on extractivism, especially in these times of pandemic. I think some of the early notions that we will have less greenhouse gas emissions and so on, and this might be a respite, might be too early as we are seeing what's happening in the Amazon with the, with the indigenous people and the rush to the deforestation and so on, and less people protesting that. So the, the book about from, from Eduardo is very welcome on that. And uh, yeah, so maybe um, um, we can return to the discussion soon, but Sana had some idea about the poll. So maybe she can put that forward now. So yeah, we have uh, just just to get the lovely attendees that we're so happy to have here listening to, to the conversation uh, more engaged into the conversation we're posting a poll and you can the discussion can can continue at the same time but please do do answer that and then our speakers can can uh address the the results from that if they want to but i'd uh also want to continue with the questions from the chat because there has been uh several people uh addressing the issue with which Eduardo has been has been taking part in the in the chat already uh, on the on the differences or the relations or are there any differences between small scale uh, extractivist projects or artisanal mining, for example. So would Anna and and Alexander and, and then Eduardo maybe also uh, in in with the video uh, to, to comment on, on this, this subject. I can comment really quickly um, because I actually had a discussion um, just last week with uh, a few of my colleagues at Ohio State University who are archeologists. And we were, you know, discussing exactly this issue. Um, you know, so how is it that you tease apart what's extractivism and what isn't? Well, you know, being somebody who, who is, you know, Eduardo, I think, is the person we need to turn to for giving us a strong specific definition, and that's something that we should all welcome. Um, that's not necessarily my forte, but I do feel strongly that humans have always been extracting. That's part of what we have done forever. That's a, a you know, a, a normal part of our existence. Um, but when we begin to, you know, you know, think only in the short term, when we get, began to take things for profit rather than because we need them to take care of ourselves, um, that's when things make the leap from extraction to extractivism, right? And that's when, as I see it, right, my personal opinion is when things start to become a very deep-seated cultural problem. Of course, those aren't, at least as I'm talking about it here, those things are subjective calls, right? What's the difference between what I need to take care of myself and my family and profiting. Well, I currently right now will admit that I have more than I need, right? I'm a member of the global north and it is not fair globally. It's not fair intergenerationally, right? That, that's true. Um, so it's interesting to think about where we can draw that line um, in that context. So again, to come back to the uh, 
archaeologist that I talked with um, very briefly, um, you know, it's very interesting to think about in the context of prehistory where there aren't records, but we have these material deposits and material evidence, evidence of a mine. How do you actually show through human history that people have been extracting and where's the difference between extraction and extractivism? Um, so again, those are just a, a couple brief comments and I will um, let one of my colleagues join in and answer the question. Should I say something? <laughs> I'm happy, okay. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I agree with both Eduardo and, and Anna. It's, it really is kind of relationally, you know, and I, I think I'm seeing, I'm starting to understand this message board thing now. But yeah, it is completely subjective. And that's what I mean when I talk about, you know, what is extractivism? What is land grabbing? What is, what is consent even, you know? It, and where do you draw the lines? of when something is, because of course people, to, to actually say in human history that people have always extracted is, is a matter of interpretation because there's a lot of ways to give back while you took from the environment. You know, I, I would say that yes, since civilization, official civilizations, east, west, north, and south, there has been high levels of extraction with serious consequences, which also came with different kind of class systems, hierarchy, and different things like this. So. I think, yes, in that sense, there's always extractivism, but I think there's ways that we, we can take from the environment, but also give back and to remember that we're a part of it and that really hurting each hurting other people and also hurting our environment is really hurting ourselves, whether we're poisoning water, we're polluting water that we drink, degrading genes, or even hurting our friends or lovers or different people like this. And believe me, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no saint, but at least this is an ideal that we have to recognize in terms of, in terms of what we're talking about. And, and I see a comment from my friend, Andrea, and yeah, this, this means not, this means about it not dominating people, whether it's women or animals. And this means, you know, obviously, and remembering that we're, we're a part of an ecosystem, we're a part of a web, and that this is challenging <laughs> sexism, patriarchy, homophobia, all, all the isms, you know, and, and really questioning domination and, and why that happens. And I think that's really at the root of, of kind of stopping extractivism is, is challenging these things. And I'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure how much time we have, but there, there's so much resistance and people fighting. And there's some ways if you develop a criteria, you can, I think Peter Gellis was good at having a criteria to talk about and reflecting on movements since the 1990s in terms of what strategies they used and how you could actually constitute a success or positive things. But there's there's so many people fighting to defend their lands, north, south, and east of the globe to protect their trees, protect the things that they love and they care about. Even in Europe, I, I just left a bunch of a bunch of people who have been fighting an enormous energy transformer in a zone de fond, and there's there was 27 of them in France alone, and there's just so many ways of of resisting, you know, antagonistically, prefiguratively, in terms of taking to stopping the spread of these things, or also trying to grow trees and rehabilitate water systems and things like this, and that. I don't think we should separate a kind of an antagonistic political practice of taking direct action away from also caring for people and also strengthening gardens, water quality and soil and things like this. And that it's just a matter of, of kind of being positive and doing the best you can with your friends and hopefully having it come from a place of joy and not out of guilt or self-sacrifice and to try to make it sustainable because these problems aren't going away. And as we discussed, it's with the COVID, it's, it's getting much worse. There's a horrible authoritarian turns and, and things like this. So yeah, I'll leave it with that. Thanks for the, for the commentaries. So maybe um, returning back to the issue with the poll or the guests. And so just to be clear on this, so would, for example, would you, Eduardo, see that the concept of extractivism could be used for stuff like data extractivism or digital extractivism, intangible extractivism. So would you use it just for natural resources? And then this question of, of, of temporality. Um, so is it, is it a concept only for the modernity or could you explain, for example, the Roman en Empire through the concept of extractivism? What would be your answers to that? Well, I Again, remember that our use of the concept is always also attached to the exploration of alternatives. So uh, if the Roman of the Incan empires were extractivist, it's very good for scholarly work for the academics, but 
but it's not for our work. If we use extractivins for almost, almost everything, that will reduce to zero, to zero, almost all alternatives. And we have already seen that in the recent past. For example, the debate with many governments <clears throat> about five, six years ago is that they have, of course, many scholars that support those governments, many scholars that support companies, and they say everything is extractivism. So you cannot <clears throat> complain about extractivism. It's only a technological issue, a technological problems, problem to have the correct fix to reduce its Im impacts and economic fix to share the profits with the local communities. And that ends in uh, corporate social responsibility and the dream of the technological fix. And we know that this is not uh, possible to get the root of the problem. But at the same time, at the same time, as you also uh, have explained, there are many, many local initiatives. Many of them are very powerful and very many of them are very useful. So I consider that the problem is not in the lack of alternatives. The main problem is the lack of how to arrange those alternatives to think countries as a whole, regions as a whole, to select which alternative is the best one to reproduce in a whole country as a whole. So the, the shift from the local initiative to start us, that we are facing extracting, to start to think as a country, as a state, as a government, on how to imagine how we'll work with very specific and concrete answers, how we'll work, how will we deal with a country, with a state that is based in strategies beyond extractivism. So our main concern is that the main problem is in public policies, political policies, how to address political discourses, not in the lack of uh, alternatives. So because of this, once again, the wording, the precision of the concept is very important because we will need responses for the natural resources extraction, but also we will need linked responses, for example, or the health system, education system, housing, and so on. This requires, for example, to think about the state budget, how to deal with subsidies, how to deal with taxes, and so on. Again, this is one of the main issues that I consider that, again, this uh, debate about this extractivism is even more relevant and urgent now. Alexander, go ahead, of course. No, I mean, I guess the more you identify as extractivism, I'd say that there, there's more solutions that you can find in equal proportion. But I mean, the, I, mean I, I can't disagree with what you're saying in terms of kind of engaging in a practical politics and trying to create some type of decolonial degrowth kind of platform to kind of integrate with things. I, I wouldn't disagree, but at the same time, a lot of this conversation until, because Europe's, where you're speaking from is different. There's, there's plenty of money, <laughs> there's plenty of money up here. There's plenty of infrastructure. There's plenty of wind turbines and things like this. And the issue is, is this, this growth imperative has to stop. There really has to be a stop of constantly having to produce and have more energy to have more plastic trinkets to have these things. There has to be a resituating of what matters in people's lives, what actually brings subjective well-being, which is the sociological term for happiness. And it's really a lot of these things are this it has to the growth has to stop. There's so many resources, there's so much extraction, there's so much energy generating stuff. But yeah, please. I agree with you, Alexander. I will add a point. I can use the same perspective for the, for example, the growth or the growth debate. There is a need of precision, which is the meaning of the growth. If you look to the, the growth uh, movement, there are many, many different positions, many different um, policy options, many different backgrounds and so on. So again, uh, 
uh, words matter, concepts matter. Words have history and have implication for policy and for public debates. So when you use the word degrowth in English and the debate, for example, in Europe and some regions in the North America, they sound very good. But if you use that word in Spanish, it sounds terrible because you have to overcome this political theology, as you said, and I agree, that everybody consider that growth is an essential component of present development, of present modernization. So again, we need, and, and I think this is more the role of the scholar, more precision of the words. I have here in my back, one of the shelves is one complete shelf about the growth books. There are many different versions of the degrowth. Which one is the best for the northern countries? Which one is the best for the southern countries? It's a good global concept. Or should we move, for example, from some of the German perspective that they speak about a growth and to remove the word growth? Which is the relationship between the growth and steady state economies, no growth economies, and so on? Okay, thanks. What about thanks? What about Anna? Would you have some answers to that data, natural resource thing, and the thing about the, if Romans can be described as extractivist? And uh, I would also like to ask, uh, what do you think of the concept of hyper extractivism, which has been around there also? Uh, is that useful or something? That should be used. Uh, in terms of the poll and the idea of data of extractivism, um, I'm part of a discipline that has actually talked about data extractivism for a long time without necessarily using that phrase. Um, at this point in time, cultural anthropology is extremely critical of past researchers who have arrived in communities, collected the data that they wanted, and then disappeared. We often refer to it as parachute anthropology. But put into the relational terms that have come up periodically throughout this discussion, you know, that counts as data extractivism, right? We're taking information, we're not giving back, we're not reciprocating, and that is inherently inequitable. So it's very problematic. Right. So, you know, um, I, I guess I would see that as a form of exploitation. Right. And if we're broadening our conception of the things that we are capable of having relationships to, to include, you know, not just people, but communities and non-human entities, um, you know, again, that follows that same pattern of an exploitative relationship. Um, so in, in the sense that I've been talking about extractivism, you know, it follows that extractivist mindset. It's taking, taking without giving. Um, it's getting as much gain as possible, using it for oneself without worrying about the long-term relationship. Um, so in the broad use of the term extractivism, that works, right? And I understand if, if there are more precise definitions that that absolutely does not work for. In terms of the question about the Roman Empire, I don't know, right? I don't know, you know, certainly we can see, you know, imperialism fitting this pattern, right? But without knowing everything about the case, um, you know, without being a historian or an archeologist, I can't claim to know what people's motives were. Um, certainly, I think it works in this, uh, you know, again, in this metaphorical sense that I've been talking about. Um, you know, we could say the same thing for many other cases like Easter Island or the Norse in Greenland, right? It was that mindset that led things to the eventual collapse. And here I'm referring to um, some of Jared Diamond's um, case studies in his um, thick book, Collapse. Um, so, Barry, um, did you want to add in? Yeah, maybe if Barry, you... Yeah, oh, back, 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 I read a critique of Jared Diamond's um, Easter Island case and a revisionist history of that, which is actually quite revealing is that, in fact, uh, there's a whole other archaeology now and a, a new literature about Easter Island that showed that until Europeans came, the Great Encounter, and their savage expansionism, the, uh, actually the whole island was a garden. There had been, you know, a lot of cutting of trees, 
but the whole place seemed to be viable and had a big population, it was robust and so on. And as in, in stages after that, which has also happened in most of the other islands across the Pacific, Hawaii, everywhere, um, similar kinds of patterns of depopulation, disease, uh, migration, colonization, land grabbing. It was at that point that the people despaired. They, uh, they gave up on their uh, social system of the past. It collapsed around them as again, is replete around the world with the European aggressive encounter with indigenous people all over the world, capital versus oikos. And capital annihilates oikos everywhere it goes. And that is true historically, and that is true historically even for 5,000 years. The Romans did that, and the Romans created the Latifundia system based on mass slavery to work their big plantations for commodity production, for export in Mediterranean markets, for profit. I mean, this is an uh, anthropological economics debate, but you can see where I stand on that one. But as Eduardo said, okay, that's for historians. Maybe we learn something about it for the present, but we should, we should all of us, uh, pause about this Easter Island thing because it blames the indigenous people that they overdid it, they destroyed their own system, the whole thing collapsed, it was all their fault. False. No, it was imperialism, colonialism, disease, destruction, that all came after the encounter with Western civilization. Let's, let's, let's correct ourselves about that one because there are lessons there. You can have a viable forest garden civilization robust and happy and you know balanced and stable and people lots of people on this planet have done that and that's what we have to aspire back to you know and at this core of it all I mean even though I don't want to repeat some of the big slogans going on just now by some of the big agencies in the world but to restoration restoration ecological restoration is essential to the tra so-called transition or massive transformation I think we all know that in other words that extractivism is so depleting and so destructive the only really positive response to it, not just in a sense resistance, yeah, but the praxis of transformation has to be restoration, restoration, restoration. Okay, I said enough. Yeah, Thanks. I know there's lots of critiques surrounding um, Diamond's work um, and don't necessarily want to get into that, but I think what you're saying, Barry, too, on another level is that the stories that we tell are so incredibly important. Um, so I, I think that's a really important point. And I guess just to sort of um, take this to the next, um, next step here, I think that if we're going to think about how we're going to study extraction and extractivisms going forward, there does need to be this you know, central and continuing place for emplaced case studies that really do tap into our power of narrative because those things do matter and they do stick with us. At, they resonate at you know, an emotional level that I think is really important. Um, so those studies will benefit from being able to see locally, right, in the sense of shifting back and forth between a zoomed in local focus and making sense of the bigger picture, uh, asking things like how extractivism impacts people at the ground level, what its larger connections and causes are, and then asking about alternatives, right? How do alternatives actually work in people's real lives is something that I think will be really important. Um, I think one of the best things that we can do is to offer inspiring examples of diverse non-extractivist ways of life that really make the case and do our job of showing people that other ways of life are possible. Yeah. So that's what I hope to see going forward. I couldn't well, agree more. <laughs> thank you for those summarizing comments, Anna and Barry. So I don't know, Sophia, can you say what, how we are doing in terms of time? It was interesting to note in the poll that we are kind of divided. The, the half of the people were thinking that data extractivism is a useful concept and the other half. It's a problematic one. Yeah, I'm showing okay. those results again real quick. So we had in our poll, we had 49% um, said that the concept could be used to describe those non-tangible things and practices. 15% uh, said no, and 17% said maybe, but it could be problematic. Uh, just so everybody knows, this fantastic session will actually be coming to a close very soon. We have about five minutes left together, so um, we should start to think about moving toward wrapping up. Um, 
as you can see in the chat, Sana has posted some information about the musical performance that will be happening as a live stream over on Facebook right after this session. That's um, with Komi, who is going to be doing a musical piece about uh, the interaction inspired by the human nature action interaction. Um, so that's a plug. I hope everybody heads over to Facebook after this. Um, but yeah, so we have about five more minutes left together to wrap up this discussion. Yeah, so I would like to really thank all the panelists for sharing your time. I think we really advanced our shared understanding of our differences and unities in understanding extractivism and seeing the world through that and how it can be used and cannot be used. And the debates will continue. We will have several more detailed panels during the for following two days. So I welcome to all your, you all to those sessions. So maybe if we use the last words for Alex and Eduardo the last few minutes to have, if you have any summarizing things to say. Yeah, you can just say whatever you want. Hope to see you in future. <laughs> well, only to thank you all um, for this panel for this excellent round table. Yes, yeah, same on this end. Thanks so much for inviting me. Really happy to speak with all y'all. And uh, yeah, good, uh, good to hear what people are thinking. What's going on? Yeah, and I would also like to thank Sana and Sofia for, for really for helping to organize this and making everything work very smoothly. You have done a lot of work for this. And all the participants, and sorry if we didn't take all the questions from the chat, I think everybody has read them and your contributions have been noted.